Hey, happy Thanksgiving. I just want to announce Project Winter. This winter, we're gonna finish all the projects. Not all of them, the 67 and the rolls, those are on like long-term holds. And the rolls is supposed to be getting worked on right now, but for some reason, scheduling issues, it will never move to the place that it's supposed to be. It was supposed to be there like two months ago almost. But I'm not worried about that. We're gonna be finishing what the, the Jeep's done, the Volvo will be done, the Capri will be done, the Saab will be done, the Aztec will be, well, it is done, I need to go camping. Basically all the projects that people ask about all the time, those are the ones that will be moving. And uh, also the big monster truck, that one, gotta get that wrapped up too. So expect a lot of those cars be getting finished up really quickly. And then uh, we'll be moving into a few more cars and of course, working more on the rolls in the 67, the cars that just stay forever. I don't really care when those get done, I'll have them for the rest of my life. <laughs> so one of these days, anyway, let's jump right into this Maserati that I was checking out to possibly buy for the rental fleet. On today's episode of Watch Chair Go, we are here to talk about the 2017 Dodge Durango. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Maserati Levante SQ4. What is going on guys? I am Watch Chargo, and like I said, I'm here with the 2017 da Maserati Levante SQ4. The Levante S is all wheel drive. Actually, all Levantes are all wheel drive. This being the S is stepped up from the base model V6. They are both twin turbo V6s, but this one makes 424 horsepower, 428 foot pounds of torque, which is very respectable for what's kind of an entry level luxury crossover SUV. It's what everybody's doing. And I think this car is just a copy of what everybody's doing. So obviously you guys just saw Hoovy's video about the Bentley Bentayga and it's W12 power plant, almost 700 horsepower, crazy sky high sticker prices. That, that one's a quarter million dollars basically and depreciation that, I mean the depreciation could have bought you another car. And of course Lamborghini's in the segment now, building on the Audi Q7. They've got the Urus, which is a, a killer. It sells like crazy. They can't keep them on the showroom floors. The minute one shows up, it's gone. Most of them are pre-sold. The Urus is just game-changing for Lamborghini. And they can make it a lot faster than they can make all the Lamborghinis because it's a Q7. A very cool Q7, I'll give it that. Then we've got the Rolls-Royce Cullinan, which is selling like crazy. Of course, Rolls-Royce is a BMW, so they have plenty of platforms to pull from, even though they don't really say what platform that is. It's kind of shared with the Phantom and the Ghost, so that makes it kind of a 7 Series, and maybe since it's a Cullinan, it might be a little bit of an X5, X7. I think it's roughly X7 sized, and uh, you know, the Rolls Royces differentiate themselves from BMWs very well. Sure, there's a lot of BMW S-ness in there, but it's still a Rolls Royce when you get in it. The Lamborghini Urus is very Audi Q7, but it's a little Lamborghini-ish, and the Bentayga, I think, uh, really kind of pulls off from the Lamborghini and Audi platform and, and it's pretty incredible. So in my opinion, the Maserati Levante takes up the rear of the pack. What this thing is, is all of the ideas that everybody's had about what an SUV, a, a luxury sport SUV should be and shoved them all into a package, but it's a lot of Dodge parts. So calling it a Dodge is definitely uh, kind of an insult to it. It's not really a Dodge. It's built on the same platform as kind of an offshoot of the Ghibli. So the modern Maserati platform which I think that Maserati has kind of lost its way, but also it's selling really well because they build much cheaper cars now. So let's take a look at the Levante S. This thing has a starting price around $80,000, mid $80,000, and it's kind of a good car to drive. I hate to say it, but while it's a complete mess, it's kind of good to drive. So let's go on a tour of this thing and I'll show you how much Dodge it is or Fiat Chrysler it is and uh, how much Maserati it is. Let's go. So we'll start outside the Levante and walk around. It is sitting on 21 inch Maserati wheels. The wheels look wonderful. They kind of keep the fork theme going there. You can see the Maserati center cap and kind of the forks leading out on the wheels. A really good wheel. They nailed the wheel. The brakes, while being big, these appear to be 14, 15 inch brakes. They don't do that great of a job stopping this car because it weighs a lot. It's okay, but if you're trying to drive it as a sporty car, it's not quite there. So. It's sitting on Pirelli's. These may have been replaced. This car has 50,000 miles on it. It's probably been through one set of tires so far. Uh, we've got the vents on the fenders there, kind of a Maserati tradition. We've got power folding mirrors and uh, the mirrors do everything you would expect. Keyless entry, just touch the handles, walk around here. Got 
a Maserati Spork back here on the quarter and SQ4 badging, power tailgate, backup camera, rear wiper. Let this thing open up. Honestly, a great looking cargo area that has a reasonable amount of storage and cool lines on the cargo mat leading up to the Maserati logo. They make sure you know there's a Maserati logo everywhere. The lights are all LEDs, but they're softened up with kind of some amber in there. So it's not a hard LED lighting. It's kind of the very, very classy new style of LED lighting. 12 volt outlet back here. And uh, there's a lock button for the doors. And of course the button for the power tailgate. Let's hit the button and let it close itself. Lots of lighting in the back, kind of well thought out. If you take a couple steps back from the Levante, all the other SUVs kind of look the same, but I think this one looks a lot like the FX35. It doesn't have quite as much of a bubble to it, but pretty FX35, FX50, all the Infinity models there. It's a good look. If they know it sells, why wouldn't they just keep making the same thing? I think those are a Dodge uh, windshield wiper set up there. And the headlights are very good, but they're not the new adaptive headlights that they do have as an option on these cars. Uh, LED fog lights, those look great. And a whole lot of active uh, heating and cooling flaps there so they can raise lower engine temp to increase efficiency. And honestly, it's a pretty efficient car. A nice big spork in the front end there. And uh, there's the parking sensors. It has rear parking sensors as well, all the way around as you would expect. And it's incredibly low on adaptive technology. I don't even think this has active cruise, which is kind of interesting for a car at this price level with quite a bit of technology. And I mean, it's, it's a pretty well optioned car. You would think it would have adaptive cruise or some self steering, some kind of modern tech. Opening the door, you are immediately greeted with the best window switches of all time. A uh, FCA Chrysler Dodge part that you can actually find at most auto parts stores, which is great if it ever breaks. Now, the higher end vehicles get a little chrome piece added onto them. So it's not exactly the same as the Charger one, but they're very good window switches. They work really well, they're reliable. I mean, I can't be upset that those are in every car. Here we have the same start switch as all the Dodges. And I think that's the same light switch as well with uh, fog lights and all that cool stuff. It might even have a rear fog light. Uh, it's got two fog light logos on there. The seats look great, Maserati door sills. It's a beautiful seat. I don't know what that's out of, but I mean, this this car is a literal parts bin. The gauges are very clearly a Dodge gauge. Uh, <laughs> key fob not detected. They just have their own software on them and some sporks in there. So you know that it's a Maserati. The wheel itself is a Dodge wheel too. It has the steering wheel controls on the back. Same switches for the paddle shifters. They feel the same and uh, honestly the same button layout and everything like that so very fiat chrysler in the wheel area before we go any farther i need the key which brings me to my next point the key this thing weighs i mean it feels like a bar of gold it weighs so much but then you pick it up and you're like that is the dodge charger key <laughs> exactly so it is incredibly heavy they just slapped a whole bunch of metal on that key and I, I mean, it works, it's just weird. We've all been making fun of the key for quite a while because it's just, it's not special. They just tried to make it look special, which is probably not the way to sell your luxury SUV. I get it, it's a price point thing, but at the same time, it kind of takes away all of the you know glory of owning a Maserati when it's a parts bin car that's made up of all the normal cars that you see every day. So the clock, the clock is very cool. It's got a second hand sweep. Uh, I think it'll probably come to life here if I start this thing up. Huh, it reverses for the seconds. That was really cool. All right, oh, there's the car raising up too. You can see uh, the front end height changing as it leaves entry mode. We've got some vent controls here. Let's you open and close those center vents. And this is one of the things that bothers me more than anything. This is of course the Dodge 8.4 inch screen. You can tell immediately when you see the interface, it does not self clear that screen. Every other car on the road now, really anything even remotely reasonable, auto clear is the important note there. But this is very, very, very much the Dodge screen. It has the little Dodge climate indicators and uh, the center clock. I, literally, it's exactly the same as that Dodge Dart. And that Dodge Dart costs less than almost a, two payments on this thing or something. I will say the climate controls, they look good. 
they work well, it's very intuitive. Of course, you can see them all again on the screen. The Maserati logo button though, is the settings, which is kind of ridiculous. You'd think it would open like a menu like the Hellcats that puts it in race mode or something like that. But nope, it just shows you the settings for the car, heated seats, heated steering wheel, all that good stuff. You saw when it started up, it does have the CarPlay, Android Auto, that's very good. Obviously that solves all problems with all screens. We all just want CarPlay. It's one of the things I'm working on is upgrading every car in the rental fleet to have CarPlay. So it's very nice upper center console there. You can see it retract, all that good stuff. SD card slot, USB for your phone, aux in as well, it's lit, it's nice. Moving down on the console, we have the shifter, which I think is probably one of the biggest disasters I've ever seen. You push and then half the time it won't come out of park. You know, obviously I wanted reverse, but it didn't go there, so you end up in reverse. And then drive. Anyway, the shifter is a whole thing. It usually doesn't do what you tell it to, which is kind of annoying in any vehicle. All the buttons right here, traction, manual mode. This is increased control and efficiency, which makes the steering very heavy, but the car really slow. It's, it's kind of a mess when it goes into that mode. You've got sport, heard the exhaust. Sounds wonderful. And then sport two, which lowers the car into arrow one mode. Off-road raises the car all the way up. Media controls here, it's volume and an outside selector dial, hazards, this is the car's height and the parking brake as well. You can see the car is currently lowering. Two cup holders, a 12 volt outlet right in the middle of the cup holders, a very deep center console. I'll show you guys that. It's lighted, more 12 volt outlets inside it, and it can be cooled by the climate control. It has a little switch in there to open and close the climate vent for the center, just like a lot of the old BMWs did, which is always nice. The lighting in there is nice. It opens up well, and uh, I mean, it's a center console. There's not much more to say other than two more cup holders inside there, you can kind of keep cool. You would think, being a Maserati, they would just grab the heated and cooled cup holders out of the Dodge Charger or something like that. Heated and cooled cup holders are one of the greatest features, and it's one of the few things that manufacturers could really play with, because they've ran out of things to put in cars, right? Cars now are flawless, per everything you could want, but heated and cooled cup holders are a hardly ever seen option. So if you just put them in the car, which you've been able to option on almost every trim of every Dodge forever, it takes it to a whole new level and it really does work. You're on an eight hour road trip and your drink is still freezing cold. It's really cool. All right, passenger side, take a look in the glove box. It's uh, pretty deep. It looks like it might have a vent in there. There's two USB chargers in there that say charge only, room for the manual, all that good stuff. Not a bad glove box. Open the sunroof up, it's pretty big. The shade retracts. Probably have to hit the button again to retract it all the way. It's ultra retract. Come on, do it all at once. That's a little annoying that it doesn't just open it all the way when you do that. Like I said, really good LEDs all the way through. They nailed the LEDs. Let's look in the back seat. Rear heated seats, that's a very nice touch. Nice window controls, rear locks, which is kind of interesting. And there's the center, what's in there? Oh, more USB charging ports and a 12 volt outlet, center climate. And I'm gonna guess the cup holders for the rear are right there as we expected. There's a ski pass through for some reason. Um, clearly the seats fall down, but there is a ski pass through. And then right here in the back seat is the world's peskiest center headrest. This thing completely obscures the mirror. I would say most of the time when you're looking behind you, all you see is that headrest. But luckily you do get to see these beautiful red Maserati logos stitched into those headrests. All the windows are frameless. Uh, they're great windows, they work fine, they don't make a lot of noise. Harman Kardon audio, it sounds pretty good. It doesn't quite have the power to carry the low, low end. Uh, I don't think the subwoofer is doing kind of the work that I expected to do, but the mid range is incredible and it has the power to keep up there, the mid bass that is, and that's always impressive. Listening to Safety by DJ Snake, you hear those mid range strings come in and like shake the car. That's one of the things I'm always looking for in a good system build, a very, very strong mid range. I don't just want a subwoofer, I don't want the car just shaking. Everything needs to sound good throughout the entire audio system. The Levante has a very good sound stage. I mean, they did a good job tuning it. I don't think they had enough subwoofer or enough power to really cover the low end though. I'd say it's a good system overall, kind of 85% system. All right, it's running. Let's listen to this exhaust. There you go. It's about what it sounds like. I'd say it's a little throatier when it's under load, but when it's under like a partial load and part throttle, it's one of the worst sounding exhausts you've ever heard in your life. It sounds like a chain skipping teeth. But then when you get on it, 
It sounds incredible. They just absolutely nailed it. So it has a nice growl. It starts up with a big dramatic show and then calms down and it can be completely silent if we put it back in normal. There you go. Pretty much silent right there. Totally different sound. All right, let's lower this thing all the way to the ground. We're gonna slam it in sport mode and actually all the way down to injury mode and then we'll put it in off-road mode and take it all the way to the top to see how much the suspension adjusts. The Levante is pretty tall in off-road mode. That wheel well gap is now gigantic and uh, it'll get pretty low to the ground as well. Well, the Levante looks great, especially from the back. Those tail lights are absolutely perfect. A little Dodge Darty, aren't they? Very much the uh, LED racetrack from the Dodges, but it's a great look. This thing pulls off what it's supposed to look like. Let's go drive it and see if it drives how it's supposed to drive. First things first, I have to talk about that exhaust note. It's one of the things I mentioned. You need to hear it now. We are in Sport 2, which should be Sport Plus doesn't quite handle like that, but it is Sport 2. Now the transmission in this car, you just heard that downshift, is the wonderful ZF 8-speed. It snaps off shifts almost as fast as a dual clutch, and it's just a hydraulic transmission. They threw that in everything because it's really good. Now, of course, we moved on to 10 speeds, but the ZF 8-speed, can't really hate on that thing. It does what you want. It shifts very fast. All right, so we're gonna take off, and I'll try to give you guys some of that mid-range sound. Nice growl at idle, leaving idle. Okay. There. Oh. What is that? Okay, now we'll do the same thing again at wide open throttle. And when it snaps off the shift, it is the most glorious sound. Exactly what they were looking for the whole time. And it's just really hard to pull this off with a V6. And I think this one kind of missed the mark. All right, we moved to Mexico. Let's uh, listen to those shifts and watch the zero to 60. So I'm just gonna go uh, full throttle right here. Wait, 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 boost. That's most of what I have to say about this thing. The exhaust note sometimes is terrible and the exhaust note sometimes is amazing. I uh, sometimes love driving it and sometimes it's terrible. The steering is probably the worst part of the whole package. It's incredibly hard to steer with one hand and it loves to wander in its lane because it's strangely like heavy, like it pretends to be in sport mode. I'm sure it's gotta be electric power steering. And you find yourself drifting in the lane a lot because you're trying to control it with one hand the way you would normally drive. You're in cruise control going down the highway and you find it wandering in the lane because it's really hard to push it around, even in normal mode. So the steering feel does change, but it never gets better on how it kind of wanders back and forth on the road. That could be a byproduct of the tires. There's, there's a lot of things that could be. I can't just blame the car for that. I'm sure it couldn't have left the factory like that, but also I'm not sure it didn't leave the factory like that, just like the exhaust note. So like I said, it's a parts bin car. It's weirdly good at being good, but also not, a, not really good at any of the things it's good at. It's just an SUV that got thrown together and it works. It makes great sounds. It's got plenty of power. The power delivery is wonderful. The transmission is wonderful. Brakes a little too small, but what can I say? It's a entry level luxury SUV. It was $87,000. This one's selling for $47,000, less than the average new car in America sells for. Maybe the real takeaway from this entire SUV war is Audi has a better parts bin to choose from a way better parts bin to choose from. The Dodge one's not bad though. If you're not looking at this as an enthusiast, if you're looking at it as a badge, I guess it might check all the boxes for you. And if you're looking at this as a soccer mom, it probably checks all the boxes for you, honestly. There's nothing wrong with it inherently. It's a good drivetrain. It's an, it's an all right SUV, and I guess it might look right in the school pickup line. Uh, it is not going to deliver on any car enthusiast's expectations, but at the same time, you might enjoy driving it for a little bit. That is it for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to head on over to shop, watchjerogo.com for cool shirts, not like this. And please like, share, subscribe, do whatever you want to do. And I will talk to you next time. Huge thank you to Walzer Audi of Wichita for letting me borrow this. It's on their lot right now if you want to buy it. I put a couple miles on it. I was looking at buying this for the rental fleet. I think it would rent really well because of the market in Wichita. I don't know if I'm going to move on that. So if you want to buy it, you know where to look. I'll throw a link in the description below.